many of us uh, you know give an excuse not today tomorrow not now i'm feeling lazy i can't get up early i have so much to do or it's nice to remain cozy in bed or in chair and not move at all we have the you know i could say the entire world at our um, uh, one glance through our phones and or through our laptops and we actually do not need to move nowadays uh, even things like alexa have uh, decreased our movement so much that uh, we just give a command and you know things are done uh but come to think of it if uh, if we look back at our ancestors if we um look at you know the caveman or you know much before that how people had to actually go out move hunt dig and bend and lift and carry and you know get their own food cook it themselves and again go from place to place live a nomadic life they were always on the move and i'm sure uh, they did not have much problems at that time because there were no doctors uh, there were no hospitals uh, nothing they would take care of themselves for that matter if in, if we look at our parents i mean some of you are all that age here so if we look at them we know that they have much lesser problems than we do. Uh, because they had to walk they had to walk a lot to go to school they had to walk uh, to buy milk every day they had to go and buy their groceries but we have it everything easy nowadays you know we just make a phone call and things come home we just book online and things come home we don't even really need to go out and this pandemic has made it even worse because we were locked up inside we had no choice but to use uh, online options so there it has reduced our activity even daily going out to school and to office was totally cut down so then in turn what what has it done to our bodies um i will share my presentation to you and you'll get a good idea of what happens to our bodies when we don't move and then i will move on to what you could do to move more and prevent problems so i'll just share my screen uh okay um can you all see my screen yes yes okay so the human body is made up of muscles and joints which form the musculoskeletal system brain uh, brain and nerves which form the nervous system heart and blood vessels form the circulatory system the lungs form the respiratory system stomach liver pancreas intestines they form the digestive system then uh just okay kidneys urinary bladder and rectum form a part of the expiratory system along with the skin and then we have the endocrine glands now for each of these systems to uh, perform their um, functions to the maximum they have some of the other movement going on okay um sorry movement is a primary mechanism of all the functions that occur in our body our body is mainly like a machine it functions all on, all organs function by moving i'll give you an example like the heart pumps keeps on pumping it cannot stop pumping at all our veins and nerves veins carry blood so there's movement of blood through the veins through the arteries capillaries nerves nerves carry carry some uh, you know signals from the brain to the muscles from the skin to the brain so again there's movement of signals intestine our food moves down from the uh, from the esophagus down to the stomach into the intestines there also there is movement 
and then lungs, lungs expand and relax. Again, the air is moving inside our body and out. Muscles and bones, muscles and bones have to move again. So each and every part of our body is moving. There's nothing that works without any movement. So then why should we relax? We just have, you know, uh, six to eight hours of sleep that we need per day. If that is good enough, then the rest of the day, even if we are just active, doing something or the other, our body will be fit. As you can see in the flow chart, when there is no movement, improper function. Now imagine if the heart doesn't move, it doesn't pump. We are no more, okay? So then if there's improper functioning, if the veins don't, you know, take the blood to the heart, or if the muscles don't move our limbs, if our joints do not move, what happens? There is disuse. Disuse. And then disuse means because we are not using it, there will be an inability to move. Because we have not used our body efficiently for a few months or years, it will lead to an inability to move. And that will lead to early onset of diseases. And finally, that will lead to premature death. Sorry. Yeah. So I hope you can see the whole slide um, clearly. Uh, Tia, can you help me with that? Uh, is there any other thing coming on the screen? Yes, I'll be the. Uh, that's, but that's okay. We can see it clear enough. Okay. Just let me remove this. Yeah. Sedentary lifestyle. What is a sedentary lifestyle? A sedentary lifestyle is that which includes little or no physical activity at all. And someone living such a lifestyle. <clears throat> Barbara, we can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. So sedentary lifestyle uh, is a lifestyle that includes little or no physical activity or, at all. And most of us has, have experienced that uh, the last two years. It was, there was no choice, but some of us have still continued to live that way, you know, pandemic or no pandemic. So someone living such a lifestyle could experience serious consequences. And what are those consequences? We'll start with the mental health. You know, you have low self-confidence, low self-esteem, your memory power is not so good. Uh, studies have shown that uh, elderly people who do not go around, who do not go for a walk every day, who do not mingle with other people, again, have the risk of increasing uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Then, also increased risk of developing poor sleeping patterns. Okay, your body has not exercised enough. And again, so your sleep is affected. There's an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, which is very, very common in India. And Indians are prone for type 2 diabetes. So we have no choice but to do some kind of physical activity. And then there is an increased risk of heart disease, increased risk of lethargy, lack of energy. Um, I don't know how, much, how many of you do some kind of exercise, but even if you do you know, 10 minutes of exercise, you feel so refreshed. But the day you don't do exercise, you realize, oh, I'm feeling quite lazy. Then there's a chance of increase in weight, uh, risk of obesity, increased risk of hypertension, that is high blood pressure in the arteries. Okay. So the World Health 
organization says that a sedentary lifestyle even um, contributes to osteoporosis. For those who do not know what is osteoporosis, is the thinning. It is the thinning of bones. The density of the bone mass decreases. So our bones have to have a specific density to be strong. And with age, this density keeps reducing. And uh, so most of about 60 years, most of us are prone to osteoporosis if we do not have enough vitamin D, calcium, and we do not exercise. But nowadays you get to see this osteoporosis earlier in life, again, because of a sedentary lifestyle. So if our bones are osteoporotic, more chances of fractures. So even as minute fall, you know, um, can give rise to a fracture somewhere in the body. So we have to be careful. Uh, you all must have heard of this, uh, sitting is bad for you. They've also said uh, sitting is killing you. Okay, why? Again, the same thing, same effects, ill effects, that is obesity, increased blood pressure, increased blood sugar, abnormal cholesterol levels, improper breathing capacity, reduced quality of sleep and improve, uh, improper digestion. Again, you may think, okay, other things are okay, uh, like blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, all that may increase. But how does breathing capacity uh, get affected? That's because when we are sitting, again, we are, you know, slouched. We are not erect. We are not relaxed. So when we sit slouched, the lungs are compressed. And they do not have the capacity to expand very well. So there is not enough breathing uh, happening there. The breathing becomes shallow. So the capacity reduces. Another thing is improper digestion. The same thing, when we sit, now uh, the lungs and the other organs on top compress our uh, digestive organs. Again, because we do not sit erect, we do not sit relaxed, we are always slouched or you know sitting in awkward postures. So the digestion is also affected. If you see, this is a bad posture. If you can see in this diagram here, anteriorly, the organs in front, like the lungs and the digestive organs are all compressed. Okay, and even the spine, if you see the spine, it's bent forwards, the head is bent forward. Okay, again, the knees are bent. So there is compression of the, you know, uh, circulatory system there, the veins and the arteries. So everything is like, you know, compressed and not allowed to expand and move freely. And it's not allowed to, um, you know, do its, act, uh, do its function in a very effective manner. So what do we develop with the back posture? Compressed lungs and heart, tight neck muscles, overstretched low back muscles. Then weak abdominal muscles, because we're always sitting and we're slouching, so the abdominal muscles become weak. Then there's poor circulation, impaired digestion, ultimately less oxygen to the brain, and deep vein thrombosis. So those who, who do not know what is deep vein thrombosis is that uh, there is a clot formation in the calf muscles, in the veins of the calf muscles. And this is dangerous because the calf muscle is a major pump, okay? So it pumps the veins. Uh, when it contracts, it pumps the veins. And these veins, you know, then take the blood back to the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. But if this pumping is not there from time to time, the blood gets accumulated in the feet. And then what happens? Slowly, if this is for a prolonged period of time, that's why they say on long flights and all, we're supposed to keep moving our feet. Why? So that the pumping action pumps the blood back to our heart. And if that doesn't happen, clots are formed. And then these clots can travel up to the heart or even up to the brain and cause a heart attack or a stroke. So we have to be careful about the way we sit and how long we sit. So I'm coming to that now. 
it's important to adapt a correct posture in sitting. Now, firstly, uh, we all have to sit, uh, you know, sometime during the day. Most people who have to work on the laptop have to sit at least more than six hours a day. So what is the right posture to sit? When we sit, we should relax and sit. You may think, oh, we have so much work. How can we relax? Relaxing means not actually relaxing in an armchair and, you know, leaving, you know, just uh, sitting at leisure. Relaxing is to relax your body onto the arm, uh, arm uh, sorry, backrest. So when your body is against the backrest, the weight of the body falls onto the chair. So your muscles do not have to contract constantly to keep you stand, sitting erect. Okay. But if you're sitting erect, then automatically you will slouch. So you have to sit straight, but sit back. Sit back in your chair. Keep the laptop uh, close to you um, and relax. Even your elbows should sit, uh, should relax on the arm rest of the chair and your feet should touch the floor. As you see in the third diagram on the top. So this is a good posture to sit or even if you're sitting with a normal table here in the first diagram, sorry. So you, you can see that this person is fully rested against the backrest, feet are rested, arms are, you know, at 90 degrees and the screen is almost at eye level. These other two are also okay as long as your elbows are resting on the uh, arm wrist. From the pictures that you um, see below, that those are the postures we, um, you know, adapt every day. I'm sure some of you will agree with me because we are so engrossed in work and we have to finish things in a short amount of time. So we're just, you know, peering at the um, computer and just going about our work. And we forget to blink. We forget to stand up. We forget to move. We forget to stretch. So how, how do we counter these effects of prolonged sitting? Stand and work whenever possible. You may think stand, uh, you know, standing will, you know, we get aches and pains in our calf muscles and it's not good. But standing is good. You can have an alternate between standing and sitting. So you could, you know, you get these uh, sit-stand uh, stations nowadays in some offices, they have already made arrangements for these, wherein you sit and work for some time, then you raise your desk and you stand and work for some time. But even if that is not available, just make it a point to stand every 40 minutes. You know, actually they say every 20 minutes, but I know it's very difficult in the midst of uh, so much work to, you know, just stand up every 20 minutes. So I either 20 or 30 minutes, make it 40 also is fine, but don't go on sitting in your chair for two to three hours at a stretch. When you get a phone call, as much as possible, you stand and walk during your phone calls. You know that at least it will give you some amount of exercise. Uh, you can even stand a little while watching TV. I know uh, maybe you're watching TV only, you know, uh, at night and then there you want to relax. Okay, you can relax that time if it's if it's only for half an hour. But if it's a movie that you're watching for two or three hours at a stretch, stand up in between for a little while you stand and watch. It's, it's going to be good for you. So you could stand intermittently while reading, watching a movie or playing video games. Walk with your colleagues for meetings. I've heard that some people have already ad adopted this, like in some companies, they have uh, stand-up meetings. So the rest of the day, they sit and work, but when they have meetings, they stand uh, in the conference room, they stand, and some of them even walk around. Dr. Levine invented the treadmill desk to help office workers get more physical activity. 
So a treadmill desk is where you keep walking on the treadmill and do your office work. That could be a little tedious sometimes, but yeah, some people have tried that as well. Another other things that you could do is stretch, just stretch out. You know, if, even if you just stretch out for a second or two, just move your wrists, just stretch your arms outside. Look to the right, look to the left, look up. Now tell me one thing, how many of us look up during the day? Do we look at the ceiling? We hardly look at the ceiling because all our work is at eye level or below eye level. If we are at the laptop, it's at eye level. Otherwise, if you're cooking or we're doing any other kind of work, we're looking at our children, teaching them or doing anything else, we're looking down. We're rarely looking up. Do we know what is there on the ceiling? No, because we know it's just the fan hanging up there. But when we walk outside, when we walk outdoors, do we look up? Look up at the sky and see how beautiful it is. Look up at the tree, tall trees. Look at the birds in the sky. No. And that's making our neck go down and down and down. We need to look up as often as possible. Remember that because all of us have a very bad posture wherein, see, if you look, uh, then uh, your should be in level with your shoulder. But you know, all of us are like this. Why? Because we're looking down. So to correct this, we need to get this back and we need to look up often. So you need to stretch. Stretch your neck, stretch your arms, stretch your limbs. You know, all the time we are bent with our knees are bent and then we feel, oh, when we stand up, after two to three hours and we feel, oh, our knees are hurting, our calf is hurting. So stretch them while you're sitting, just stretch them, you know, because our joints need lubrication. And lubrication happens when there is movement. The nutrients are uh, replenished in the joint. The cartilage gets some uh, replenishment from the blood vessels surrounding them and the nutrients from the blood enter into the joints when we move them. If we do not move, that does not happen. The cartilage hardens, the uh, synovial uh, fluid around the joint dries up. That gives a lot of uh, pain. It gives rise to arthritis at an early age. Even the neck, the discs, there are discs in between each bones, which uh, act like a cushion and they prevent friction between the bones. And that again needs movement. If there is no movement, they do not get their nourishment from the blood supply around. And again, the discs become thin and dried out. So again, we need to move. So we need to stretch. As I said earlier, the veins need to pump blood to your heart. So move your feet, you know, even if you're busy in work, just keep moving your feet whenever you remember. Just move your ankle up and down and then all around. Yes, so even, uh, yeah, when we stretch, especially when we stretch our hands up or outwards, what's happening? If you just, all of you just stretch your hands outside and let's think about what happens uh, to your trunk. Are you all doing it? Just stretch your hands outwards and then lower. What happens to your lungs? Do you feel you're able to take a deep breath when you raise your hands up? And then when you lower them, you can breathe out. So now combine it uh, with breathing. So as you raise your hands, just breathe in. And as you lower them down, breathe out. Do you feel a nice uh, sense of air going into your lungs? Your lungs expanding. Do the same forward. Now keep your hands forward. Okay. Stretch them. Raise them up. Look up. Take a deep breath. And as you're leaving your breath, just lower your hands. Do you feel that your back is 
stretching do you feel the lung entering i mean your air entering your lungs you feel nice isn't it i cannot see your videos but i hope you are doing this okay so in between work in between your tight schedule if you just stretch i'm sure your schedule will also not be so tight you'll feel relaxed and you'll be able to concentrate better another thing i should um, 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 you know tell you about is do not hold back your urine get up often and evacuate your bladder which we often tend to do you know we hold back and we say no not now i have so much work to do i have to submit this this is a deadline i cannot go to the washroom but no you're going to harm your urinary bladder you're going to harm your kidneys and because of that ultimately what happens you will stop drinking water when you hold back your urine your bladder is full you can't drink more water so again that is going to affect you so do not hold back your urine get up often and evacuate your bladder whenever there is an urge so these are some of the stretches uh, that i have been showing uh, most of my participants at an ergonomic workshop um uh, and i made you do one or two of them if you see exercise number 10 11 you could see that the um, in exercise number 10 if you see we are just crossing one leg over the other and stretching so we are stretching the muscles that come we are stretching the muscles that come from the hips to the knees and then we are turning our back so when we do that again when we do that we are stretching the spine as well as we are stretching the muscles of the lower limb and we are improving our rotational flexibility now this has also reduced how many of you can turn and touch the center of your chair without any pain can you all try that where wherever you sitting just turn and try to touch the center of your chair maybe difficult if you have not, never done it before but if you start doing it slowly it will just help you get this rotational mobility you may think this is not required but yes it is very well required because all our functional activities that we do at home mostly at home not at work is when we take out something from above or we lower down something or we pick up something from down we rarely do it straight most of them are rotational activities and that is when we realize we get a catch suppose we are lifting something heavy from up from a top shelf and then we suddenly turn and we have not done that for several months or days we realize something in our back is just going to snap so why don't we do it on a daily basis why don't we stretch these muscles as well and if you look at uh, exercise number 3 again crossing the hands over the head and then bending now this sideways bending is also very rare no we mostly we bend forward and pick up things if we have to we rarely bend sideways if we have something on the side we again bend or we turn to the side and then we pick up Yes that's the way it should be done but then what happens to these muscles over here from the side from the arm from the back of the arm and down towards the abdomen you know they also need to be stretched so if you could do some of these stretches in between work and it hardly takes you know time because it's not that you have to do all of them together you keep this chart on your monitor somewhere whenever you remember you do one or two of these when you're taking a break stand up and do it because uh, seeing you somebody else may be influenced and if they have not taken a break they will stand up and do the exercise with you there's nothing to be ashamed especially when you're at work it's it's something that you should do and inspire others to do 
these are some of the leg stretches. Uh, I would not advise older people uh, to do this uh, without assistance or without guidance. But uh, younger people who are still more active um, should, you know, try doing some of these exercises again to keep their back fit, to keep their lower limbs fit and stretched. And this is for the legs. Uh, recently, I think in the last um, seven to 10 years, only all these marathons have started. And uh, we get a lot of patients who come to us with knee pain or calf pain or foot pain uh, because they have run in a marathon or because they're practicing for a marathon. Now, marathons are long distance runs and um, we need a lot of training before we you know, get into a marathon because you know, each and every muscle of our body needs to adapt uh, to that force of running, that speed of running. It, we need to, you know, the blood vessels need to pump harder. A lot of changes occur when we run. But if you're not used to walking itself, we cannot straight away go to running. And if our muscles are tight, and we have not exercised for several years, and suddenly we say, no, there's a marathon. Come on, let's take part. We cannot do it. You may be able to do it in the first go, but you realize a few days later what happens to your muscles. That is why, uh, especially people over 40 who want to run a marathon or who want to take part in any such activities have to first stretch out their muscles, learn to stretch your muscles, see that you do not have any aches and pains. Because once the muscles are strong, then you're, they will keep the bones uh, you know, strong and the joints will efficiently move. If the muscles are weak, there will be certain muscles opposite to them which will be tight and that is going to affect your joint mobility. If the muscles are not strong, ultimate load goes onto your joints and there's more and more wear and tear in your joints. Uh, that is why we see a lot of uh, knee arthritis patients who come to us even before the age of 40. It's very common nowadays. Uh, for that matter, even neck and shoulder problems are very common. The most common is neck problems. I told you why, because of sitting, slouching, forward looking and not looking up and not doing any stretches of the neck. The next is uh, knee and the next is lower back. So these three are the most common, neck, knee, and lower back. Again, because of faulty posture, lack of movement, lack of exercise, lack of stretching. But uh, you could always, it's better late than never. It's not that, okay, now I've crossed this age, I shouldn't be doing this. No, you could be doing all these exercises, but with proper guidance, go to a physiotherapist close by, ask them what's the right way to do it, and then, go about doing some exercise. Coming to standing, why is standing better than sitting? The human body is actually designed to stand. Mm -hmm. uh, in sitting, most of the load of the body is upon the spine. It's upon the center portion, the spine. So the more you sit, there's more compression of the discs and there's more pressure on the spine, more the, Spinal muscles have to work harder to keep you erect. Um, and, you know, a lot of it affects the spine. So when you stand, immediately the load goes onto your legs. So you're relieving all that pressure from your back and letting it go through your legs. Then what does standing do? It's, so it's better for your back. It strengthens the leg muscles and it improves balance as well balance. How many of you can stand with, on one leg with eyes closed for at least 10 seconds? It's very difficult for those who have never tried it in a long time. For those who are physically active, I'm sure they will be able to do it. So it's the same thing. Now, why, why do I say eyes closed? Because when you're in a dark area and you have to walk, your balance will be affected if you're not able to stand on one leg with eyes closed. So if you stand for a longer period of time during the day, it improves your balance. Excuse me. It 
it definitely burns more calories than in sitting. And it's a great antidote for the formation of blood clots in the legs. I told you the pumping will be more because when you stand, you're not going to be standing straight all the time. You will be moving from leg to leg. You'll be moving forward, backward. You'll be adjusting your position. So it's your blood vessels need to be pumping the blood frequently. Another thing is you feel more alert. Heard of anybody feeling sleepy in standing? I doubt so, right? When you're standing, you're more alert. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to stand. So standing is better than sitting. So what could you do to stand more often? As I said earlier, you could have a sit-stand desk or you make a home adaptation, like you use your, uh, your table for some time, then find the countertop which is a little higher, like a cupboard or something which is higher. Go and keep your laptop there and work, stand and work for some time. Keep a blinker on the screen so you could stand every 40 minutes. Then you could stand during meetings. You can stand and talk to your friends. I've already done this. Next is walking. So from standing, of course, the next uh, part we moved on is walking. Now imagine a child when he's just learning to walk. He's so excited about taking a, a few steps. He struggles and struggles, tries two, three times, stands up and falls down and then, but he still wants to take that step. He sees us all walking around and you know, the child is eager to walk. But what happens after a few years? When we start sitting, we are less eager to walk. That should not be the case. The benefits of walking daily are, that it cheers you up. It definitely will cheer you up. Try it out, I'm telling you. It reduces stress and increases your self-esteem. You feel better that you feel, wow, I can actually do this. You get fresh air because you're walking outside. You, you meet people, you see the nature around you. It's definitely going to help your mind. You can lose weight. Uh, research says that 30 minutes every day burns up to 200 calories. Imagine burning up to 200 calories. All of us, you know, I mean, most of us youngsters are now always counting calories. But if we don't walk or we don't do anything to burn the calories, it's of no use, you know. Uh, only dieting. A lot of us go into these uh, diets where we say, okay, we'll cut carbs, we'll, uh, we'll only eat proteins or we'll eat only this and uh, we'll fast on juices and all. But that's not going to help us if there is no activity. Because the moment we stop that kind of a diet, we're going to put on weight. So if we balance our diet along with activity, we uh, are definitely aiming for a good goal of losing weight. Then walking lowers blood pressure, it improves sleep, and it energizes you. Another thing is uh, research says that in quite a lot of people have felt a major dip in snack cravings, even after a 15 minute walk. So the next time, you know, when in your free time, if you're, you think, okay, let's go and have a samosa, or let's go and have some chips, or let's have some Coca-Cola or something like that, which is not really good for you. Instead, go for a walk. Even, you know, even five to 10 minutes of a walk will help you put aside that craving. Another thing that um, walking does is it stops the loss of bone mass. Osteoporosis, I told you earlier. So because there's weight bearing, now joints need weight bearing. That means your weight has to pass through the joints, especially bigger joints like the hip, knee, ankle, and the spine. So there should be weight-bearing activities for uh, decrease in the loss of bone mass. So if you stand, if you walk, there is weight-bearing on those joints. So there is replenishment of those minerals into your bones. And that's why there is, I mean, osteoporosis will be less. Then you could enjoy it because of all this, if you really walk and 
benefit from all this you will enjoy a longer life yeah uh, how many of us how many of you must have thought of this being on a treadmill for an hour is really good so next week i'll think i'll start walking so just being on a treadmill will it help you think about it what else does walking do it tones your leg and abdominal muscles it supports your joints it improves your breathing rate and oxygen uptake by the lungs and it slows down all the mental decline and lowers alzheimer's so it will cut down all the ill effects of sitting so but there are certain things that you need to um remember when you start walking what you need to do is grab the right gear that means shoes should be comfortable clothes should be loose and airy you could use some apps or a pedometer to have have you count your steps and you choose your course carefully preferably outdoors so that you get enough sunlight and fresh air and when you choose outdoors also try more or less to choose a level surface with with not too many ups and downs we we'll always start with a warm up 5 minutes should be slow walking then you continue the next 20 minutes walking uh, slowly picking up speed and then slowly reducing Fi final 5 minutes should be a cool down again where you walk very slowly and then you could do a few stretches you could make it enjoyable like you could you know walk with a friend every day you could listen to music and walk or you could you know even um you know think about uh, some enjoyable moments that you had with your family vary your routine you can even vary your routine like uh, on certain days you walk in the morning and certain days you walk in the evening uh but always remember to start slow see now if the last two years you haven't been walking suddenly you can't start walking for 30 minutes start with 15 minutes a day for at least 3 days a week and then make it every day at least 5 days a week and then increase your uh, time slowly another important thing is to track your progress so because when you start slowly if you start 15 minutes you could always um, know you know okay in 15 minutes i can walk uh, a distance of so much and in some days when you increase the time you know how much more you can walk and you know how much more energy is there in the rest of the day so nowadays you get all these gadgets um, you know step counter pedometer some apps in the phone these all help you to count your steps please excuse me a minute so step counting helps you track your daily progress um so what is the ideal step count healthy adults approximately um should the least is 4000 and maximum is 15000 steps a day but 10000 steps a day is a reasonable target for healthy adults okay so within 60 years of age and for older adults uh, 60 plus at least 70 uh, 7000 to 8000 steps for older adults and for children it could be even more again depending on the age and sex of the child it should be uh, between 12000 to 15000 steps per day so if you can i mean it's not really necessary for you to track it with a pedometer but then it's an in thing and a lot of people have it and uh, they display it very nicely on their wrists whether they are walking or no so why not you make use of it and you know uh, track your progress so even small <laughs> light dusting of your exercise equipment can give you a start in your exercise okay so how do how do we increase your uh, step count take the stairs whenever possible and i know there are lifts everywhere it's very convenient to use a lift yeah, and you may feel really tired at the end of the day to climb stairs but i believe me i uh, i enjoy taking the stairs unless i'm really tired yeah, i can at least climb three flights of stairs 
I know it's not very easy for those of older age, but if you start young, it's definitely good. Uh, you should take the stairs whenever possible. Even in your office, when going from one floor to another, take the stairs. Use uh, restrooms or meeting rooms that are further away from where you sit. Okay, so that will at least make you walk a little. Um, then walk while talking to your friends or on the phone. Another thing you can try is uh, try dancing or aerobics. Uh, a lot of people try Zumba. Um, yeah, that's also fine as long as you're, you know, you have a good train. Now, uh, one good option is to park further away from stores or destinations. So another benefit of that is you could avoid the parking fee and you could walk. You could get some exercise. Um, and those who use public transport could very well get off a stop early and then walk to your destination. For children, now because of the last two years of online classes, now children have also been sitting for a long time. So you could consider ways for children and teenagers to earn screen time. Like, you know, you make them do something else and so they could earn some screen time. Then agree a family limit to screen time per day. Uh, make bedrooms, um, a TV or computer or laptop or phone free zone. Do not make them use a TV, computer, laptop, or a phone in the bedroom, especially. I mean, of course, with online classes, they have to sit in a bedroom and use it. But otherwise, uh, set no screen time rules to encourage other activities like outdoor games. Encourage them to go outdoors and play. Encourage them to participate in household um, chores setting the table, taking the bins out, or even some, uh, or even some kind of uh, sports training outside the house. Choose gifts such as a scooter or a skateboard or ball or a kite to encourage active play so that they go out of the house and they move. Summer is approaching. Don't go chasing an ice cream truck. That doesn't count as an exercise. Okay, so for coming to older adults, some older people, 60 and over, are known to spend nine hours or more each day sitting. Okay, so imagine what that could do to your body. I've already explained to you the ill effects of sitting. So a study show of 6,000 women ages 65 and older from the University of California, San Francisco showed that age-related memory decline was lower in those who walked more. As I said earlier, memory decline will be less in those who go outdoors and walk. Aerobic walking and resistance exercise program reduced the incidence of disability in those who are 65 and above and those also who have arthritis. Okay, so walking and resistance exercises, those using bands or weights, you know, but again, you have to do it under guidance. So how do we, how do older adults reduce uh, sitting time? Firstly, avoid long periods sitting in front of a TV or a computer. Then again, stand and walk while you're on the phone. Use the stairs whenever possible for whoever does not have a problem already. Those who have a problem and cannot do it, obviously you need to tackle the problem first. Then take up active hobbies. Join in community-based uh, community activities such as dance classes and walking groups. Take up active play with grandchildren if you have them. You know, move around, play with them with a the ball. In the house at least, you know, you could you just play with your grandchildren and do most types of housework. Uh, reduce time um, spent sitting or lying down and break up long periods of not moving with some activity. Like go do some housework that you're able to do. You know, you should be able to, you should do uh, your housework when you're able to do, you know, so that it will keep you active. 
150 minutes of uh, moderate intensity activity a week is required for older adults. 150 minutes a week, which could be broken down into a few minutes every day. So I've just broken it down into light activities, moderate activities, and muscle strengthening. As you could see, you know, light is just making a cup of tea, vacuuming, making the bed, watering the pots, cleaning and dusting your own room, then moving around the house. Moderate activities would be walking, swimming, dancing, riding a bike. Uh, again, these all, it depends on how much you can already do. Don't go just trying out something very new, uh, especially if you're older. So do it all under guidance. Muscle strengthening. Uh, now, carrying heavy sh uh, shopping bags is good for you. If you really do not have a problem, you should go ahead and do it. Lifting weights, uh, resistant band exercises, push-ups, sit-ups, all this need to be done under guidance if you have not done them so far. Sorry, I'm talking for so long after a long time. So throat is a little parched. Okay. So the Cleveland Clinic states that many studies have found that people who are physically fit have higher bone mineral density and stronger bones than those who are inactive. So I told you about osteoporosis. It's the same. Um, those who are active have high bone mineral density. And uh, there are studies who, who've said that women who stay slim by never sitting down, you know, they actually stand for 10 hours a day and it boosts their health too. Most of you are women here, I think. Um, and I know most of you would have worked hard all your life and are still doing so. So continue to do so. Be active, be fit. The daily physical activity can keep you fit and help you fight disease. So what are you waiting for? It's time to get up and move. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Uh, we will now we will now move on to the question and answer session. So if anybody has questions, I hope you have put them on the chat page and they will be answered. I think everybody was busy listening. So there are no questions so far. Oh, but okay. folks, please do ask Barbara's available to answer questions. Please do shoot. Matilda, I have one question. Yes. Will you disconnect this uh, PPT? It's still on. Uh, 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 Barbara? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Barbara, last week I, I have been informed that I have frozen shoulder in the sense I have my left hand uh, has pain, so also my backside. How does it occur and what's the cure for it? How can you overcome it? Okay. Uh, so frozen shoulder occurs uh, sometimes without any reason. Without any reason, you could get a frozen shoulder. And it's very common in uh, those about the age of 50. It's very common in diabetics. And uh, sometimes there's just no reason. It is the, you know, the cartilage around the shoulder, which hardens up. And you first find it difficult to move your hand behind the back and then overhead activities are difficult. Now, there is uh, another reason why you get frozen shoulder is that if you've had any previous ligament injury in your shoulder, ligament or muscle injury or a fracture in your shoulder earlier in life, then also you are bound to get frozen shoulder anytime later in life. So the only way to tackle it is uh, with exercise. And uh, it depends. Now, if the pain is too much, we first need to reduce the pain. 
uh, and we do use uh, a few modalities, you know, some electrical treatment for that. If you go to a physio, we use that to reduce the pain. And then we give certain mobilization techniques for the shoulder to improve the uh, mo movement of the shoulder. So that depends on different stages. Uh, it depends on which stage of frozen shoulder you have. And sometimes if it's a very mild thing, it will go off on its own within six months. But sometimes it uh, increases so much that all your daily activities are uh, affected. So um, the first sign that you cannot do something that you were always able to do, you should report to a physiotherapist and get it treated. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, then there's a question, what about those who already have an active, I lost the question for one Active life and at work and exercise and yet have bone issues like neck pain, lower back pain, knee pain. Yeah. And maybe due to post LV lack of calcium. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, we need to find out because each one's uh, body is made differently. Um, so we need to actually um, evaluate and see why uh, this is happening, why these bone issues are happening, even though we are active. Sometimes overuse and overactivity can also lead to problems. So we need to actually tackle that problem by, uh, you know, you can go to a therapist, ask them to assess you properly to check why this is happening. Um, and most often they can find a reason, but sometimes even um, sometimes you, you really don't know. It just happens. You are prone to it because of your genetic makeup. You are prone to certain bone and joint problems. And if there's a family history, even more. And yes, uh, also you have said about post-delivery lack of calcium, which is uh, very common in all women. And also post-delivery lack of uh, exercise and lack of uh, proper nutrition immediately post-delivery leads to problems later on. So what you could do is that uh, you may not be able to get back uh, to 100% normal, but at least you could exercise certain muscles so that you know it doesn't worsen. So you may be prone to a certain problem, but you uh, want to avoid the recurrence. You want to avoid uh, the increase in frequency of that, uh, you know, severity of those uh, problems. Then you will just have to do certain exercises to strengthen those muscles. <clears throat> yes. And from one message from a question from Annabelle. I have a problem of recurrent dislocation of the right shoulder. So I'm scared to rotate my right shoulder or raise my right hand too high. Is it okay? Yeah, so recurrent dislocation of the shoulder happens when there are, uh, the ligaments and the muscles around the shoulder are not strong enough to support your shoulder. And uh, once the shoulder uh, dislocates, it will... Um, you know, happen again and again, unless you strengthen your uh, muscles and uh, strengthen the ligaments. So there are a set of exercises that you need to follow and you need to do them regularly, at least for a period of three months. Because without those exercises, uh, this is bound to recur. There's nothing that can stop it. Uh, even medicines cannot uh, stop a uh, recurrent dis dislocation. It's only exercise and building up the muscles in that area will help you prevent uh, further recurrences. And sometimes even with exercise, if it doesn't work, then for a dislocation, they, uh, they do a surgery wherein they tighten certain uh, ligaments. So that is the last uh, step. The first step is always you go to a physiotherapist, learn the proper exercises and follow up up to three months. Problem is people go, they learn the exercises, do for a few days and then forget. That if you do that, it's, it's not going to help. Any more? Yeah, so... Uh, Yes, Annabelle, you said you do TheraBand exercises, but even then, if your shoulder is recurring, so ideally you have to check whether you're doing the exercises correctly. You could go to the physiotherapist and check whether anything more can be added to strengthen the shoulder. And even if these 
uh, things are not working, you have to go in for a surgery. Uh, because all the time you cannot avoid rotation of your shoulder because that is something which is, you know, we, we do with our uh, daily activities. Rotation of the shoulder is an important movement. So if you're scared and then you limit that, it can also give rise to periarthritis of frozen shoulder later. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. better you tackle you. it now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else has? Any questions? I have to say thank you. Looks like everybody has understood everything and no questions as of now. Marjorie? Marjorie? Looks like we've lost Marjorie. Um, yeah, uh, I, I was just typing a question. Uh, can you suggest some exercises for senior citizens? Uh, see, I, I, I showed you a chart, uh, a, a few activities that you could do, but yes, uh, senior citizens, again, um, we will need to go uh, um, patient by patient if you already have a problem, but if you, you're pretty much okay, um, you know, active lifestyle, then there are certain uh, simple stretches that you could do. Uh, simple things like just raising your hands above your head, forward, sideways, you know, uh, just a few rotations of your arms, uh, you know, standing against uh, a wall and then stretching up straight as much as possible. Um, turning, um, turning side to side. Um, there are many such activities, um, Auntie. So, uh, yeah, I could uh, maybe show you one on one if you if you are interested to learn. That's that's a good idea. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. Um, so, should we now uh, conclude, Matilda? Marjorie, uh, just one moment, please. Yes. There's a question. Huh. Why do we get pain on our heels when we stand for long? What should we do to relieve it? Question from Minnie Ambrose. You're muted, Barbara. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pain in the heels is uh, due very often and most likely due to a condition called calcaneal spur. Uh, mm -hmm. The bone of uh, the heel is uh, is called the calcaneum, and sometimes an extra calcium growth, like a small, uh, you know, tiny horn-like structure, mm -hmm. grows out. Uh, that uh, again is uh, it. There's no cause for it. Um, it just happens, uh, and it's. Um, more uh, frequent in those who have suddenly gained weight. Um, so what happens is when they get up uh, in the morning, first thing, they're not able to keep their heels uh, on the floor. They cannot walk. There's a lot of pain. And when they stand and walk a long time, they get a pain in their heel. Uh, so there are things like you could do like hot fermentation for your heel. There are certain stretches that you could do for your uh, muscles of the heel and the foot, the, um, you know, the sole of the foot. There are certain stretches which you could do for, uh, you know, stretching out the fascia and the muscles of the um, soles so that this will help in relieving the pain. And, and uh, this is a condition which does not go very easily because whenever you're standing, the weight of the body falls on your heel. 
so there are certain things that also you could do like use a cushion heel in your um, you know slippers or your sandals or your shoes use slow, uh, soft slippers when you walk use um, soft footwear at home all those things uh, could be done but if the pain is really bad it's affecting your daily activities then you should go and uh, see a physiotherapist uh, there are various uh, new techniques that have come up like laser shock wave therapy uh, which help in relieving the pain so you could you know always consult a therapist and see what can be done We have one more question. Yes. Can, can you suggest some home remedies or food we can have to improve our bone strength? Bone strength, uh, yeah. Uh, one thing is be out in the sunlight uh, whenever possible. Uh, I don't know how many of you have checked your vitamin D status in the, uh, the last one year at least. But because we are indoors and also because Bangalore weather is such that we hardly get to see the sun, uh, our vitamin D is very less. Uh, so first thing is get out in the sun. And for those who are, um, you know, who are really deficient in vitamin D, they have to replenish it by taking the supplement as well as uh, sit in the sun from, uh, from 10.30 to 2 is the best time to at least uh, sit in the sun for 20 to 30 minutes to with most body parts exposed, um, like at least your hand and feet and your face, so that you absorb the sun. I know UV rays are bad, but if you're deficient in vitamin D, you really need to get out in the sun, first thing. Uh, then calcium is another thing. So calcium-rich food can be taken, like uh, milk and uh, uh, milk products, and uh, even egg and um, ragi and... Um, uh, certain more uh, uh, foodstuffs. I'm not very sure of the food part of it, but yes. Uh, so calcium rich food, vitamin D, and even weight bearing exercises, as I said, standing, walking, and especially outdoors in the sun. 